I am so excited to be here and share a little bit about history, its importance to our downtown and within our community, um, and why a big piece of our work with the Downtown Walla Walla Foundation is on historic preservation. Um, and this is a chance to share what I like to think of as big history, those huge important moments, as well as like the little h history, the day-to-day -day stories, hence histories, um, that make up our incredible community. So we'll take some time to look backward and dig into um, the past and the buildings that make up our historic downtown now, as well as a little look into the future and the stories that we will make going forward. So um, I am a very casual presenter. Feel free to interrupt with questions. You can also save them for the end. Um, I also was asked by my seven-year-old the other day why I move my hands so much when I'm speaking. So apologies. I will try not to flail the way that seven-year-old Alyssa thinks that I do. Um, so as we dive into history, the first question that I always think of and start to ponder, and it's sort of the moment of history that we're living in, is what is history? When does it start? Who is it for? And our history today is going to focus on two periods, um, so from about 1880s to 1910, when many of the historic buildings in our downtown um, were created and built, and then looking ahead 1950 through today at the work around the historic preservation of those buildings. So we'll be focused on those two time periods and uh, very much the white history of Walla Walla. But I do want to touch on the longer history of Walla Walla and just take a brief moment to acknowledge the Native American history that came long before this. So I want to acknowledge that we are here on the occupied traditional lands of the Cayuse, Umatilla, and Walla Walla people who have stewarded this white land for generations before the history that I'm going to touch on today even started. Um, and so all of these things are done against this backdrop of this historic land that we are a part of that Fort Walla Walla also acknowledges in incredible ways and the people who allowed us to have this land and create this history here. And you can see there a nice little picture from 1915 of our Native American friends. And then a little map that shows the area in orange is the traditional lands of the Cayuse, Umatilla, and Walla Walla. So we're kind of smack dab in the middle of that. So history, historic preservation. I'm guessing when I talk to a group like this, I don't need to tell you why history matters. But history, and particularly the history of place, matters to me because of the people that are connected with this. And so I'm taking a hard right from Native American history to the Beatles, and apologies if you have this song in your head for the next day, but these are Beatles lyrics for a song. There are places I'll remember all my life, though some have changed. And all of us have these places inside of us that we connect with, that we feel powerfully for and about. They're connected with the people in our lives, they're connected with our activities, the things that we love. And preserving those places and those memories is why I care so deeply about historic preservation. Yes, the buildings are beautiful, and yes, we're going to talk about that, but the buildings are nothing without the people who inhabit it and their little h histories that make it part of our community. So as we dive into this, I want to talk a little bit about how Walla Walla to this day really prizes preservation. And for me, it was solidified a couple months ago when I was just having a bad day, right? We all have those. And right now, when we're living in this big H history moment of COVID, it can be incredibly challenging. So I'm already having a bad day and I'm in a terrible mood. And I pick up my kids from daycare and they're both in bad moods too. And one of them asks me, is there anything good right now in the world? Oh, that's hard to hear as a mom. But luckily, we are driving by Pioneer Park at that moment. And I stepped out of my bad mood enough to say, yes, there is something good. And I'm going to show you what it is right now. And we saw preservation in action because Walla Walla gets preservation. So I assume most people in the room know the story of this tree limb. 
But if you don't, the high level story is, this is a tree in Pioneer Park. Most of those trees were planted around 100 years ago. And for generations, this tree arc, this tree branch, was a site where families would gather and take pictures. And they were connected to the tree, but they were connected to each other. And then the tree branch started rotting a little bit. And so you can see in the picture, the city first came in and put a little stand underneath the biggest dip to try and prop it up. But even that ended up not being enough. And so in a huge community effort and lift of preservation, the city carefully removed this tree limb and had it cast in bronze at the Walla Walla Foundry. They preserved it and reinstalled it on the tree. And I told the story to that day to my kids that a city loved a tree so much that they preserved it. And that is something that is good in our world. And one of the neatest things to me about this tree limb is that yes, it will live on into the future and be a place that we can continue taking our families and taking pictures with. But it was preserved in such detail that if you haven't yet looked at it, go look because you can walk up to it and you can see a little heart that someone had carved into the original tree branch that says K plus J. And you can see these marks and these pieces of our actual history forever cast in bronze. And that is something to me that just tells the story of why preservation matters. Yes, it's important to keep the beauty that surrounds us, not just because it's beautiful, but because of the beauty we all feel inside when we're connected to that. So Walla Walla gets preservation, and we're really lucky with that, with our historic buildings downtown and our historic homes throughout the community. That said, historic preservation as a movement has only been around about 70-ish years, and there was a time when our community and us as human beings didn't necessarily understand historic preservation in the same way. So let's talk about buildings for a second. Does anyone recognize this building? A couple nods. So this was a downtown building right on 1st and, or 2nd and Main Street. So Baker Boyer, which you all have a picture of, is kitty corner from this building. But all of you have never seen this building or maybe saw it in your youth. It was taken down and given a new facade in 1951. So today, this is what this building looks like. So I share that building, which is the Jones Building downtown, and this building, does anyone recognize this building? It's in Port, I was gonna say Port Orchard, Port Angeles, I'm mixing up my ports. No, Port Townsend, I mixed it up twice. Um, so that's the Hastings Building in Port Townsend, which is now the flagship building of their Main Street. And it's a highly recognizable architectural wonder that we could have had here in Walla Walla if we had had the same knowledge of historical preservation that we do today. And this wasn't uncommon in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. So in the historical movement of this moment, you have troops returning from World War II, you have a thriving economy, you have a GI Bill, you have all of a sudden more money in our communities, and partially as a result of that, you see people starting to move out to the suburbs. You see the rise of the shopping mall. You see all these other things that pulled business and people out of our downtowns, out of the center of our communities. And you see something like this happen with a lot of buildings. Now this one to me is especially tragic because it was, the facade was fully removed and then fully stuccoed over. Other options, or other buildings, and I have a couple of examples of these, were just what's called wrapped, where they were basically just covered in some sort of a material, so that in the future, people could remove that flat top and restore the original facade and create amazing historic buildings. But at the time, there wasn't this emphasis on historic preservation, and there were no historic preservation tax credits to create a financial incentive. So when the Jones family took down this building, they didn't think the other building was ugly. They didn't want to destroy a landmark. It was just considerably more cost effective to do that than it was to preserve a building. So historic preservation, as it moves forward and becomes our downtown, really began in the 1970s. So 
kind of happened in Walla Walla in the 1970s, but the movement of the American Main Street, which we are now a part of as the Downtown Foundation, initially launched in um, the Midwest. And it started when Mary Means, who was the founder of the Historic Preservation National Main Street movement, visited what is probably the most iconic Main Street in our country. Does anyone know this Main Street? Disneyland. Disneyland. I tried to get a shot that was far away from the like beautiful castle in the background, because not many places have a beautiful castle on their Main Street, um, and ours doesn't. But this is Main Street, Main Street, USA. So at this moment, when Disneyland is being created and the entire country is starting to abandon their downtowns, Walt Disney creates a downtown that becomes the entrance to the most magical place on Earth. And it's not by accident. Walt Disney created Main Street USA in memory of his Main Street that he remembered fondly from when he lived there between, I think it's like 1906 to 1911, the exact same time frame that Main Street in Walla Walla was up and running. So this was inspired by Marceline, Missouri, which you can see here. Looks a little different from Main Street USA, does not look that different from Main Street Walla Walla. So you have this moment when all of a sudden we're recognizing that it's not just about getting the best deal or the best parking spot or having the best options to go and shop. It's about the community that is created downtowns and the history and the beautiful places that support it. Now I will note, I tried to find an exact, exact comparison in terms of the years. The top one there is like the Walt Disney living era, 1906 of Marceline, Missouri. This is more like 1930 Walla Walla. So you can see some electrical signs and things like that that create the difference. But still, it's a recognizable Main Street. And if any of you have spent much time downtown, that bottom picture is likely a recognizable Main Street because it hasn't changed that much. So starting in the 1980s, sort of unofficially in the 1970s and then officially in the 1980s, there was a huge move of which downtown Walla Walla Foundation was a part of, as well as Walla Walla 20 and the city of Walla Walla to preserve this incredibly special place our own most magical place, maybe not on Earth, but I like to think in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so we're at a point now where we have all these historic buildings. And I'm going to touch in a minute about what that means in terms of actually being on the historic register and the tax incentives that come with that. But I want to start by just talking about what makes a Main Street building. And this is this little handout you all have in front of you. Um, and if you don't have a copy, I think we might have some extras in the back. Um, this is something I wanted to have in your hands so that as we look at the example buildings I'm going to share after this, you can refer back to this as sort of a model Main Street building. And this comes from our State Historic Preservation Office, and I just love that they could use a downtown Walla Walla building as a perfect example of a Main Street. So, I won't go into what every one of these terms are because I just kind of want to hit on the highlights, but it's recognizable and once you know to look for them, you'll notice most of our downtowns have them. So cornices are those top little pieces that jut up from a building and that both makes the building look taller from the ground and if you happen to have to do work up on a roof, it's about a three foot ledge that helps keep you safe and they're designed to be that sort of beautiful. Um, traditionally, with our Main Street buildings, the downtown or downstairs will be your shops, your retail, and the upstairs will be either offices or living residences. And historically, that's how it's been. That's a holdover from the days when people would buy a Main Street building, their shop would be downstairs, and they'd live upstairs. So today, it's mostly reverted back to office buildings or office space, but you do see still some upper story living. Um, and I do want to talk specifically about windows, because when we start talking historic preservation, windows are often a make or break deal. Um, so you'll see if a building has its historic windows, they want you to maintain those if you're going to apply for historic preservation tax credits. And things like, so after I'm looking at the page, mullion, which is basically just the dividers in a window, for historic preservation masters, things like that are really important. So they want to see that same division on the window. 
as well as windows on the ground floor where they're large to let in light. A lot of these buildings were built before there was always electricity or before there was um, cost-effective electricity, as well as display the products of the retail that you are trying to sell. So of course, with Baker Boyer, where it has almost always been a, a bank, those windows have, would not be used to say, show dresses. But a lot of other Main Street buildings would show that same thing. And I share this partially because as you look at the, the example buildings I brought in the rest of the slide, as well as some of the planned ones that are new builds, you'll see these same elements included. So these are something that as we at the Downtown Foundation talk with building owners who are looking to revitalize their building, we give them something like this to say, here's what you might wanna start thinking about. And this becomes especially important when it comes to them using tax credits and us, us recently being listed as the on the National Register of Historic Places as a neighborhood. And I share this partially because it's exciting news, like at least within our world, it's taken years and years, probably close to a decade, to get us from applying to be as a National Register of Historic Places to approved just in August. So super exciting. That also followed one failed attempt in the 1990s to get us approved. So the work we have done and the city has done and our preservationist friends have done to make downtown and preserve this history is part of why it's acknowledged now. I also share this as an attempt to begin crushing rumors that always come up around this. The main concern you'll get from people when they are talking about being listed on the historic um, register is will that limit you in what you can do with your building? And I know when we were house shopping, that was one of my questions. There was like a plaque of like, built in 1909 on the house we were looking at. And I was like, does that mean we can't change anything? Because um, that's a little scary as a landowner. You know, you want to be able to have some autonomy over your building. Being listed as a neighborhood on the National Register in no way prohibits what someone can do with their building. If you are a landowner, if you are a property owner, you can do whatever you want with your building, um, as long as it's within city code. And so in this case, our goal is to help people who may not want to, or may not see the benefits of historic preservation to understand that more clearly, and then help them access the tax incentive that can come with it. So we do have in our country now, did not have it in the 1950s when that beautiful Jones building was torn down, we have now something called historic preservation tax credits, which without getting too wonky and crazy about tax incentives is basically when someone updates a building, they get taxed at the rate that the property was before updating for a 10 year period. So if you buy a building for a million dollars and you put $3 million worth of work into it to make it updated, revitalized, all those things, you for 10 years get taxed at a value of $1 million, even though your building is worth 4 million. So it can pencil out, and one thing I do in my job when I work with developers is help them figure out how to pencil that out so they're saving money and saving places. We like saving money and saving places, all of the above. So the neighborhood as a whole is now listed, which means anyone updating a building in downtown Walla Walla is able to access these historic preservation tax credits without having to um, go through the process of getting their individual building listed on the register. So my hope is that some of the buildings that have sat empty for a while because of that prohibitive factor may end up becoming more attractive to develop and that we can continue to grow um, and bring some of these buildings back to life. So with that said, I wanna transition to talking specifically about a few downtown buildings. And we'll see here examples of ones that have been updated really nicely as well as some that I imagine all of you are curious about, and some that have really big plans that are being done in a way that honors the history that make me excited about what comes next for it. And so that, for me, starts with this building. And I like to think of this as, first and foremost, a big H building. This is a big history building. So this today houses Falkenberg Jewelers and Brasserie 4 called the Reynolds Day Building. From a capital H history perspective, this building is where the Washington State Constitutional Convention was held in 1878. So at that point in our history, Walla Walla was one of our biggest cities here in Washington, and it's where 15 
men, I was going to say people, but men, I don't think many women were invited at that time, gathered together to start planning out what our state constitution would be like. That's a big history moment within our community. But there's also a lot of little history with this building. So this was, this business, Falkenberg's, was brought over by Christian Falkenberg in 1893. And my favorite thing when you start researching the history of some of these big names in our community is their job descriptions are incredible. Like my job is an executive director of a nonprofit. And before that I was something else, but it's just one thing. Christian Falkenberg, when he, you see like listings for him and his jewelry store was a jeweler, a silversmith and an optician. And you see this throughout your historical buildings in downtown, and it just cracks me up every time. Like Holly's Flowers downtown, which is this beautiful, um, different style of architecture. The original owner of that was an undertaker and a proprietor of fine fruits. Like, and it's just that community feel of you do a little bit of everything, and you still see that today. We call them side hustles now. But um, I just love that thing of like the different jobs that we all had to ha have. Um, so this was little history moment. A young man named Jerry Cundiff worked here at Falkenberg's in 1913. He ended up buying the business from Christian Falkenberg and his, I think son, I'm gonna, maybe someone knows, his son, I'll say, Skip, is the owner today. So it remains a mainstay on our community, starting with that little history moment when Christian came here in 1893. I also love this building because you can see this is a historical facade circa about, uh, let me see if I have a note on the exact date. I didn't write that. Oh, 1906 was about when it looked like this. And then you hit 1950s, 60s, and it got that wrap I was talking about. So when the Cundiffs brought, bought that building, it looked like that for about 15 years until the 1990s, where in this case, that wrap just covered all of these windows. So it was still a big project, but they were able to remove the wrap, reveal that incredible facade that if you look at it, has all those indications of a Main Street building that you see on your anatomy page, and it now holds this third generation, second generation family business right on our Main Street. And that to me is what makes it so important. It's beautiful architecture. It's amazing architecture. And you'll see people taking pictures of it. I have another picture later in the slides of like one of our classic marketing photos of downtown Walla Walla is of the clock and that building. It looks good, but it feels so good too. Um, so that's sort of the done right in a good place building that you see. Started historic, got wrapped, has been restored. And I want to touch next on a building that is called the Daylight Building in downtown that I imagine a few of you will recognize. So this is the Daylight Building, as it was originally called. You all may know it better today as the Macy's Building. And there's two big questions I get asked in my job, um, and we'll see if I get asked them here today. But the second most common one is about the Macy's Building and what's happening with that building. So, before I get into that, I want to talk about why it was called the Daylight Building. It was built around 1910, and it was one of the first buildings on Main Street that had the giant windows on both the bottom floor and the upper story. So it was called the Daylight Building literally because it was full of daylight. And it's one of those sort of like crushing moments when you learn the history of it to then go in it today and see that they painted over the windows on the entire upper story. So it's not a daylight building anymore. And it's now on our main street. Macy's left in March of last year. It's pre-COVID, but of course it's been a different type of impact to have this building on main street that's empty and big and hard to fill. Because a building like this is not that expensive for the type of property it is. Macy's building today is on sale for 1.7 million. That's kind of a steal in downtown Walla Walla. But it is that inexpensive because if you were to go in and put something into that space, you would most likely trigger a change in use update. So if it changes from anything other than a single use retailer, 
it would trigger seismic upgrades, it would trigger fire system upgrades, all of these things to make it more of a space, uh, or more safe of a space. This is a 50,000 square foot building. I can't think of a single retailer in America who would be looking for 50,000 square feet right now. So whatever this building ends up becoming, and I'm happy to share my thoughts on like best vision of what it could become, it will likely have to be broken up into separate pieces. And that gets expensive. Change of use, upgrades to the space itself, and that's where that tax incentive becomes key. Because for 10 years after someone buys this building, and, and it starts, the taxation starts when the renovations are complete. So for 10 years from renovations being complete, it would be taxed at 1.7 million, even if it was now worth 4 million, 5 million, more than that. Um, so, I mean, to me, it's a lot of money, but in the scheme of our architecture and our real estate downtown, it's not that much money given the tax value you could get out of it. Um, and I just love this picture because this came from the Clicker Christmas Trees Facebook page. And if you go and you find this Facebook post and it shows this um, tree set up where they set up trees all along the canopy. The coolest thing about that picture to me is not that people say, oh, look at these beautiful windows or wow, what a great example of Italianate architecture. It's that they say, I can remember to go, uh, going to see Santa in that shop. I can remember going with my mom and her trying on perfumes while we waited to get Christmas gifts wrapped. It's that little H history, the people who are connected to the stories of this place that make it meaningful. So yes, I wanna get someone into this space because it is a huge empty space downtown and because I want to revitalize that corner and because I want to increase our tax base and all of those economic reasons, but I'm also not ready to let this place stop having stories. I want all of our buildings downtown to have more stories. So, got behind a bit on my cheat sheet. So, when we look at how and why we preserve these spaces, it's because we want them to be places businesses wanna be and humans want to be. And I have a really good example, both of someone who did it well, and also a nice story of what could happen next with that. And this is likely another building that you would recognize in our downtown. So today it is the Goodwill building. Sometime in the next couple of years, it will stop being the Goodwill building because Goodwill purchased land right over here that they'll be building a new center in. And so this is another building with an amazing history ahead of it that we can't quite see yet. And we will miss Goodwill when they leave us. But we are so grateful for the work that they did because when they took it over, you can see it was a um, auto shop. And it looks like one, you know, and it's an amazing building, like supported that business, we love it. But when Goodwill bought it and they wanted to make it like the preeminent Goodwill in the Pacific Northwest, they added back in that brickwork. They added those big windows. All of those things that you see on your anatomy were incorporated into that by really smart architects. And if you happen to go down to that street and look at that versus the, it's now called House of Smith Winery across the street, they look very similar because they're the same architect. Because when Goodwill bought this building, they said, that's what we want. You did that right, do that for us. And they did. And we ended up with this beautiful space that is fully renovated inside and out. And when Goodwill leaves us and we will miss them greatly, we're unlikely to get another thrift store type shop down there. It's just not really the model of our downtown at this moment in time, given the prices that this type of real estate demands. But we're going to have an amazing Main Street building that we get to fill with something new and exciting, um, which I will join what I think is the general consensus of people where I hope it's not a winery. <laughs> I tell any developer who comes and is looking at a downtown building, we are maxed out at wineries. They honestly would not be economically successful right now. But could this be a series of small shops? Could it be a um, commercial kitchen that the community rented out? Could be all of these things. And that's, again, part of my work is to help vision what we need and hear from all of you what you want so we can start filling our empty, beautiful spaces like this. Unlike the Macy's building, this one will have a pretty quick um, I don't know if it'll be a quick takeover, but it'll be an easier sell because they've already done a lot of those upgrades that are needed versus what you would need to do with the Macy's building. So, Last one, maybe last one. Let me double check I didn't add anything. 
almost last one, um, is just down the road from here. You might know it as the old YMCA, you might know it as the old Oddfellows, or you might know it as the Penrose Hotel. So this is right on Spokane Street, and um, for a long, long time, it was a YMCA and a public gym. And it was first put in place, big history, big H moment, um, by Stephen and Mary Shipman Penrose, hence Penrose Hotel. And they were, um, Stephen was one of the early, I think the first president at Whitman. I see a couple nods, we'll go with that. We're gonna go with that. And he and his wife Mary were just huge champions of human rights and cultural development and higher education. And they did what a lot of Walla Wallans still do to this day, where they took their good fortune and they reinvested it into our places. They wanted to build places. And I literally just thought of it this moment, but I was at the YMCA now yesterday in a different location. And one of the things I thought about while I was there is it's a place where I have community. It's a building I can go to and either totally work out alone or be talking to other people, but either way, it is one of my places that I have an emotional connection with. And that's a gift that started with this building in, I think, 1906. Yes, 1906 was when the Penroses raised the funds and laid the first cornerstone of this building. So from that time, it became first a YMCA and gym, it was briefly the Odd Fellows, and it's been closed for a while. Um, and it, right now, if you look at it, I didn't copy in a picture, I'm sorry, of what it looks like currently. It's still this huge, beautiful building, but it definitely looks abandoned. And a couple years back, um, a gentleman named Stephen Day ended up purchasing the buildings with plans to turn it into what will be called the Penrose Hotel. And of course, COVID kind of threw everything off, but those plans are still in the works and it's slowly moving forward as these projects do. These aren't like one year flips with these types of buildings. They're seven years projects sometimes in order to get all the pieces together and get it updated. But it's an example, and you can see this picture on the bottom is a rendering of their initial proposal on what this space could be. So this element is your existing building, and then this was a proposed addition. Now, when this was proposed, and they knew they wanted to take advantage of historic preservation tax credits, one of the pieces of feedback that they got was that it was incongruent being that tall on the other side. So that was proposed to be a 10-story building, which if you can imagine, it's a four-story right now, which is about the average height of our largest buildings, give or take a couple exceptions in downtown. If all of a sudden there was one that jumped up that much, it wouldn't necessarily look like it was part of the neighborhood in the same way. And it's really important to this owner and this ownership group to honor that history. It's important to them because they wanna feel part of the neighborhood. It's also important to them because frankly, it pays. When our visitors come to us in Walla Walla, one of the elements that they are looking for is that historic feel. They love it, they tour for it. I know James and his team see that here at the museum as well. The history tourism is a very um, good bet when it comes to the economics of something. So fine, they can be in it for the money, but they're doing it right and they're utilizing the incentives. So eventually, you know, maybe this side gets built, maybe it doesn't, but this building will be restored. And again, if you look at your um, little cheat sheet of the anatomy, you see a lot of the same elements. The dividers on the window, the big windows on the bottom, the cornice up top here. Those elements become part of preserving the existing building and anything new you buy or anything new you build, you benefit when you match them. Now, I love this space and I'm excited for this space because it's going to bring some additional life back to that section of the city. But to me, big H history aside, love its history, I also get excited by the little H stories that come up with all of this. And if you're down in this area, which is just across from Heritage Square Park in downtown, I highly encourage you to walk to the back of that park right by Mill Creek and read the historical marker there. I remember walking down there one of my first days on the job. So I started this job in February of 2020 and the first like three weeks, I spent a lot of my time walking around, meeting businesses and just exploring this downtown. 
I'd lived here for five years by that point, and there were still places I'd never been in downtown Walla Walla. And one of them was that back of Heritage Square Park, and it's a little H history moment. So when you go there and you see this marker and you're standing next to Mill Creek, you, and it points across the street, or across the stream, behind what will maybe eventually be the Penrose Hotel. And it just says, Edgewater Park Dance Pavilion. And to me, as I read that history and you see grand opening dance, Edgewater, I have a hard time putting myself in the shoes of a Stephen Penrose who has money and invest that wisely. Like maybe someday I get there and I build our next YMCA. But to me, that's an aspirational thing that may or may not happen versus going outside and dancing under the lights at an outdoor dance pavilion. I can immediately imagine that. So I think about when this first opened in the 30s and you have these people and if you read the sign, it says they come from all over from Milton Freewater over to Dayton. Can you imagine coming from Dayton in the 1930s just to dance next to the river downtown under the lights like I can feel that I don't know any of those stories personally. I haven't talked to anyone who danced there, but I can just feel it and I feel it in the way of like that's the community I want. It's the community that I get excited about. And it's the community that I want to preserve going into the future. Because there are stories there. We've had these stories for this whole time, and we're going to make more of them into the future. I think about my kids and on these bad days, and my kids are five and seven, right? They're little. I've controlled to a large extent their narrative around this historical moment that we are living in right now. But it's a hard historical moment and it's hard to give that context to them. But they have had moments since we've added something like First Avenue Plaza downtown, where we go and we get ice cream from Bright's, another historic business and a historic building that's been around for 80 something years. They get those and they'll say, let's eat them under the lights. And we go and we sit under a yellow umbrella and those lights are overhead and they're just giggling and laughing and they have face masks down under their chins that are getting covered in chocolate ice cream. And my hope is that that is what they will remember, that those will be their stories of our place, that they can trace through the historic buildings that they will recognize a generation from now, and that all of us will be a part of preserving. And to me, it's those stories that are so important, and it's part of where I'm going to end today. I am blatantly stealing this line, there's a story here, from the city of San Antonio. The city of San Antonio, a couple years back, wanted to capture the history of their area in a better way. So they started an app and they called it, there's a story here, they, get it, they called it TASH for short, like hashtag TASH, it was this very modern way to gather history. But as they, and they, they just opened it up to the community, they said, go to a location, tag it on your phone, tell us the history of what happened here. And you've got a lot of those big H history moments. Um, where, you know, it's, and I don't know the history of San Antonio well, so I couldn't speak to what they are, but it's those big H, you know, the state constitutional convention was held here in 1875 type of moments. The coolest thing about this app, though, is they can track where people go visit. And some people will go and they'll check in at those big H history moments. But more people go and check in at the little H history moments. This is where my mom and dad got engaged. This is the movie theater I had my first kiss in. This is where I met to plan a political protest. This is where the hill you were taken to when people were breaking up with you was. Like all of these little H moments we as humans want to connect with so, so closely. And it's the stories we all have as Walla Wallens. So yes, it's big H and it's historic preservation and beautiful buildings and I will walk around downtown with any of you and look at all of our buildings and talk about the history of the people that brought it there. But what I think about and what I wanna start planning for is how we can create more little H moments. I want Macy's full so that more people can talk about what it was like to visit it at Christmas time. I want our parents to recognize Walla Walla when they're telling their, or you know, to show their grandkids Walla Walla now and those grandkids tell those same stories about those same places a generation from now. 
Yes, it's creating beautiful places to historically preserve it, but it's also creating those beautiful memories that are really what connect us and ground us, not just in the economy, but in the a community. And I get really excited about that, if you couldn't tell. So thank you so much. I'm happy to take questions about history or Walla Walla or any of those downtown elements, past, present, or future. I'm also curious, I might have a bonus slide that I'll show you guys if someone asks the right question, because I find it fascinating. So we'll see. We'll see if anyone asks the number one question I get about downtown. Yeah. So what's going to be happening with the old rose room? They are a building that I hope, so these are the old rose rooms. Am I allowed to talk about the old rose rooms and the business there with this crowd? <laughs> James nods yes. So I'm from Nevada where this is still legal, but here in Walla Walla, the old rose rooms that you're referring to were once the home of our um, bordellos and the lovely little prostitution rings that were held there. Um, those buildings have been vacant a long time. And my hope is that under us now being a National Register of Historic Places, that building, which is not on the register, will have an easier time accessing those and being able to get them. So those are conversations we're having. Um, because we do want to, a lot of our revitalization has been on the east side of 2nd Avenue, and we want to start pulling that more toward the west side and just strengthening that neighborhood. So. I'm extremely curious about the underground uh, wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so for those who don't know, there is a um, network of underground tunnels in our area. I, Ugh, this may just be rumor, but one slide I ended up taking out because I was running out of time was a picture of our Chinatown, which was located in that area. And um, I think those two are connected. So they're still there. Um, they still do connect those buildings. A lot of times they've been um, cemented off, but it is an opportunity to um, reopen those and open them to the public and explore. Uh, yeah, so tours. Pendleton has a great series of underground tours. There's no reason we couldn't do it in Walla Walla, um, other than you know safety and opening them up safely. So that area in particular of Fourth and Main um, does still have many of them that are open. Yeah. I know the theater next to Main Street has been repurposed. Yes. Yes. So um, we'll go back for a second. Where's my Macy's building pictures? Nope. Yeah, so the Liberty Theater is right here. So I honestly don't know with the age of this picture if that's another wrapped building that covered that facade. This isn't the Macy's building. It's the Garden Garden building. <gasps> because you wouldn't see those in other theaters. Foolish me, you're right. OK, so just pretend that's the Macy's building. Yeah, let me see if I can find it. Anyway, okay, without going too in depth. Yes, so the Macy's owner, the Macy's was owned by a, Macy's is owned by Macy's. Liberty Theater was owned by a different group and it did sell to a local person who just loves the building and is looking at ways to bring it back as an event space. So whether or not it will actually become a theater again is unknown at this time, but that's one of the people we're working with to help access some of these historic preservation tax credits. No. So that building, not the one I showed a picture of, but the actual Macy's building, um, yeah. Um, that was built initially as a department store, I think just a locally owned one. It was the Bon Marche for a while. Macy's bought it in, I want to say, the mid-90s. I might have the ownership mixed up there of when it went from Bon Marche to Macy's. Thank you. This is what I love. Sometimes when I talk about the history of Walla Walla, I feel so um, silly since I've only been here six years. And then there's people who are able to say like, it was once this. And then um, I have a two year person in the background. Um, yeah. So yes, Liberty Theater, separate ownership taken over by someone who wants to do really cool things with it. It's just a matter of finding all the funding to get it there. 
It's also an interesting example of how tax credits can be beneficial. Does anyone have a guess on what the Liberty Theater sold for? $300,000. So if you think about a building that you spend $300,000 on, and it needs a lot of work, but if you get taxed at a $300,000 valuation for a 10-year period, that can start penciling really quickly. Yeah, so that was, yeah, the funding for that space came primarily from um, COVID-19 relief funds. It was part of the economic recovery of that space. And it has, if you haven't heard, been approved to be made permanent and leveled out, at least on sort of the north side of the street, um, to keep that whole space a community plaza. She found my secret slide. <laughs> um, parking meter question, maybe talked at public meeting. Anyone want to guess when this article's from? Yeah, what year? Yeah. Um, this article is from the mid 30s. So parking is a big challenge and we haven't solved it in 90 years. Um, but it is something that as we add in these new elements, we want to be able to address. And part of it in my mind is um, both creating more accessibility and more handicapped spaces that are within a close distance and also design work to make our existing parking lots more comfortable. So if you've parked downtown recently in any of those lots, we have, I don't remember the last final count, something like 798 public parking spaces in all day lots within two blocks of our main street. So you'll hear some people say we have a walking problem where we can't walk two blocks, but I think we have a design problem where those blocks are really, um, ugly and don't always feel safe and don't feel like part of the downtown experiment experience. So I think, you know, if, if I have my say, which luckily I do a little bit being over downtown, um, uh, some minor efforts to beautify and connect those parking lots better, make that two block walk feel a lot shorter and a lot more accessible and for a lot less money than building a parking garage, which is also something that gets talked about on occasion. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks view private cars sitting downtown as storage of a private vehicle by the community. Mm. And uh, I keep being told by planning uh, engineers and everybody else that that's a storage and that we should be willing to give up storage to increase the viability of downtown. And so I'm sitting there thinking, how do people Mm. So it's a whole perspective I had never thought of that yeah. your car sitting in that public lot is storage of your private vehicle. So. I mean, I would disagree with that when we're talking the like short term parking. Um, yeah, and so ticketing has come back recently, so we'll see if that moves anything with parking. Um, if there, it's a privately owned space, like some of our buildings have private spaces, then that is part of their space. But I mean, I don't know. I think, well, one, I feel better not having solved parking in a year and a half when I know it's been a problem for 90 years. Um, but I do wanna make it easier and feel better and not feel like the constant fight, like private storage versus public space feels like it's a sidetrack from the actual challenge. I see a few questions. Let's start here. On the parking issue, so you know we have the building at the corner of the second and main that has already started some restoration work mm -hmm. on the road. And uh, you know, talking about a destination hotel. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we talk about Penrose, they have no parking, and they talked about ballet parking. We have the Finley, uh, you know, and that was the couple that you know, that was going to be a destination hotel, and 
<laughs> yeah, um, and that's something that, again, when we have conversations with developers, we talk about, um, particularly those large-scale projects. Um, so to talk about those two specifically, um, the, the second and main piece also bought a property that used to be the Ford dealership over on Rose and Colville. So right now it's sitting empty as a parking lot, but it could become, it was purchased in order to potentially become parking for that hotel, which again is not that, it's a, you know, three block walk that if you make the walk easier and you're seeing incredible things all around you, that's not that far, um, especially if you offer valet. Um, it's one of the interesting challenges when we talk about a space like this. So the Edgewater Dance Pavilion is right behind the Penrose Hotel, would likely become parking for that space. And there's some discussion about, is that where we, it, would it be worth it for that hotel to build a parking garage there? I hate the thought of losing what was once the Edgewater Dance Pavilion, but realistically, is that going to come back? Probably not. Um, I mean, we'll have, the Heritage Square revitalization on the other side of the stream that might become a new center for dancing downtown. Um, but spaces like that could be part of the parking solution there. And it's also why developers would look to buy a building like that that comes with that significant empty lot. Yeah. So the Yes. And I think the only thing I would challenge on what you said is you will always have people who, due to accessibility and disabilities and things like that, will need to park right there. But there are cities and places all over the world where people willingly walk three, four, five, ten blocks from parking to where they are. And this isn't me saying we want to grow to a point where we're a city where someone has to do that. But the reason they're willing to walk those numbers of blocks is because it is, there is so much to see and experience along the way. One of my favorite parking stories, and then I'll get to your question, um, comes from Disneyland. Again, it's a Disney story. And Disney had a problem at their um, Wild Kingdom Hotel, Wild Kingdom Hotel. People would come to park there, and you could pay a lot of money to park in valet right up front, or you were in this huge parking lot that went like half a mile away from the hotel. So they were having all these discussions. Do we build more parking? Do we add more of a parking garage? That'll block the view of the animals. It'll block the view of the park. And they put in place the simplest solution. Has anyone heard this? Does anyone know what they did? They imprinted paw prints of the animals in the animal kingdom into their parking lot. And so it becomes part of the experience. For me, as a mom of two small kids, if I get out of my little SUV and I'm looking at a mile or half a mile of dragging my luggage while trying to hold my kids, I'm complaining about that parking. But if I get out of that SUV and my kids immediately go, not look how far that building is, but oh my gosh, let's follow the giraffes, let's follow the cats, it became part of the experience. And almost overnight for a very small cost, complaints about parking went away there. And so when we look at this, we want to make sure the spots that are right up front are available for the people who need them. And in my mind, if we can make the experience, if you do have to park a little far away, that much more pleasant and part of what you get to do downtown, 
Maybe it solves the problem, or maybe we just end up with a beautiful street corner, and either way, for $10,000, I think it could be worth trying. <laughs> and then maybe I'll start charging those high dollar consultant fee things that we got from some of our parking experts. But it is a problem, and it's been one for nine years. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And there's that's it's part of the work we do is always looking at what other people do. Going back to the San Antonio, there's a story here. Example: um, cities all over the world grapple with parking, and you know, I I grew up in Denver where they closed their entire main avenue um, to cars but they have a shuttle that just runs continuously from one side to the other. Now, I don't, we're not the same scale as Denver. I'm not saying we needed a shuttle, but that's another example of how we can, you know, start to peck away at it. I'll just say, I'm, I'm a newcomer here. I think the parking is great. <laughs> the parking is easy. I think it's wonderful. Yeah. So I think it's partly just kind of perspective. I came from a place where parking wasn't so easy. Yeah. Life is easy here. <laughs> Well, and it's, I'm glad to hear that, and welcome to Walla Walla. Um, but as part of my outlook as the executive director of our downtown foundation, who cares deeply about the people and the places that are down there, to um, really hear from everyone on what they experience and be able to, if not solve the problem, at least somewhat try, try and creatively address it. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, it could be worse. There are cities where it's a lot worse. Um, but also, let's try a few things. Parking meters didn't work in the 30s. There's no discussion about bringing them back now. Um, we tried something. It didn't work. We try again. Yes, we talked about that briefly in the presentation, even though I had the wrong picture for it. Um, and we can touch base afterward if you want, rather than. All those buildings seem to have something above them. Are they apartments? Are they like? A lot of them are offices right now. Um, there is. Yeah. Um, and there is an effort to try and bring back more second story or above housing as part of an affordable housing solution. Um, again, it gets complicated with codes and particularly fire codes to make those, um, make them pencil. Um, so if we do end up adding them, they end up being expensive and not actually addressing affordable housing. But working through those logistics is absolutely something we would do. Um, in the meantime, most of them are either empty or offices. Mm -hmm. Do I think there will be trolleys again? Um, unlikely in terms of rail trolleys, but one of the things that our visitors love so much that honestly I don't even notice anymore is our buses that look like trolleys. And so is it possible if we look at expanding parking options downtown that there's a trolley bus that shuttles people from a parking lot to Main Street? Maybe. Um, I think if, yeah, if, there, if there's a trolley type system anymore, it would be through our buses, I would guess. And I like that they look like trolleys, even if I don't always notice it in my day to day. Yeah. 
Money at the end, a high rise parking lot. Leverage. Mm -hmm. It is something that gets talked about. Um, it's just a large scale infrastructure project that would take a lot of money. Um, I will note most of those two blocks away parking lots that I'm talking about are all day parking. So if you move your employees out there, have a way to get them downtown easily and then keep the main street spots for visitors um, to our retail places. Could help solve it, but it is, it is a challenge with the high density area for sure. I know. I, as a huge advocate for downtown, I also have a husband who feels exactly that way. He does not like going downtown. Um, and so when I think about our community and not just our visitors, that is a big heartache for me. That uh, to me, it has both to do with parking and um, I talked to a Whitman College and I saw James stand up, so I might be running out of time. Um, there was a Whitman College I talked, to, which Whitman College student I talked to a year ago, who I was talking to about downtown, and her comment on it at the time, this was pre-COVID, um, was that it felt like downtown Walla Walla was more about consumerism than community, and that broke my heart. And it was also as I was starting the job and wanting to hear all the problems, and. To me, it is the beauty of a space like First Avenue Plaza and the planned Heritage Square Park is that it's spaces people can come to and not spend a penny. And I always said when we were first planning that, and it was, yes, it was COVID response. It was about keeping our businesses afloat, giving a space to eat outside. But I said at the time that I would know it was a success the first time I saw people down there playing cards which I finally saw like two months into it. They didn't, weren't, they didn't own anything, they, didn't, they weren't drinking anything, they didn't buy anything, they were just sitting there playing cards. And so this is a separate lecture that maybe I'll come back and give another time. Historic preservation aside, my vision for our downtown is more community, maybe the same consumerism, but more community. And the spaces we are creating, and it ties in with this, those little H memory spaces, um, I think will be a big part of that. And if I just solve that and parking, maybe in 90 years, I'll hang up my shingle. <laughs> I'm happy to hang around if anyone has any questions, if there's anything else you want to talk about, whether history related or downtown related, or I don't know, one year old puppy training related, the other things in my life. Um, but thank you so much for coming out tonight. I loved getting to share all of this with you. And there is so, so much more. If any of you ever want to just like, give me a call, shoot me an email, schedule a time to walk around downtown together. We can talk about all of these things and so much more because making it a space that is good for all of you is my number one mission. Thank you very much. Thanks, James. Thanks, all of you.